Very good. Yeah, thank you guys. Sorry, hey, sorry guys that I'm late. That was that wasn't because of me, but because of the professor that was unwilling to leave from this lecture. And uh, I think that he came from the Department of Physics. I was not aware that in a Department of Physics they are so excited about the lecturing that I was have to have to twist his hands to, to force him to leave the lecture room. Anyways, so how we are doing? How is my voice? Is it not? No, it's okay because it's just showing me. You know, I'm from these ingredients. You don't, you are unable to do the miracles. It's okay. I think it is a lightning. It's okay. It is what it is. Even though that I had a haircut on Saturday, but I guess that that doesn't help me too much. Okay, guys. <laughs> yeah. Hey, 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 Musa. But just the, for your information, I'm gonna keep the lecture today a bit shorter than usually. Oh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Suraj. Thank you, Mustafa. Appreciate your help. So, uh, how are you guys doing? You're doing okay. What about online participants? They at, le at least they say respect and they're asking about how is going to be the rotation of particle today. We will not discuss about that today. And very soon we're going to leave the entire world of mechanics. We're going to start discussing about something else. But prior to that, I want to learn something from you, and something that I would like to learn from you. And I'm going to put the, you know, again, I'm going to do my edits such that the, what I'm about to discussing now will be disappearing from my final recording, final um, video from the YouTube. But in two weeks' time, in three weeks' time, I promise to deliver a presentation about online lecturing, something that you know, what I do here is this YouTube business and my Socrative and in-class quizzes. So what are the things that I should mention in my presentation? What are your advices to me? What is the thing that I should mention? Well, let me first ask this you. How much you like this YouTube over the other recording devices? I think the other professors are using this Echo something. So how is your feeling about Echo versus YouTube? I don't hear you. So you say what? So YouTube is the best. YouTube. Can I use this statement in my presentation? So, so you, you guys are saying that the YouTube is better than Echo. What, what, what's the software again? Echo 360. Okay. What's the problem in Echo? And the sorry, online participants, we a moment here, I know that you guys are desperate to hear more about rotational particles. You will hear that. Just a second, we're going to discuss about a little bit about other businesses, and then soon we will move to mother body system dynamics. But prior to that, so what's the problem in Echo 360? No problem. But the YouTube is better. Why it is better then? Can you guys elaborate a little bit, a little bit? Audience. So what was it? I couldn't hear you well because I was hearing this, wearing this. Okay. All right. Ah, oh, me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, the one thing that, you know, for online participants, the answer was that, you know, the YouTube makes me more popular. And I like that a lot, but I don't get it, the, the system of YouTube, because I'm expecting to get the money delivery from YouTube. And uh, it's not coming. I don't know what's wrong. Yeah. So he said, I got like 250 um, subscribers. So is that like uh, 2,500 or how much money I will get? 200,000. So 1,000. 1,000 is a limit. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. But but I got the email from YouTube, and I think it was uh, last week, and they said that I can give a handle to my my channel, meaning that I can give a you know name to my handle to my channel. And I was thinking Professor X. Would that be a good name? 
maybe because of all this respect business. <laughs> I need to think about that. Or I can go bore, be boring and say, this is a simulation of a mechatronic machine. But you guys just like YouTube more than Echo because you're used to deal with the YouTube. Is that correct interpretation? Because it's something that you're familiar with. Okay. What about in-class quizzes? Is this okay that you like to play with me or is it a little bit childish? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. All right. So um, do you feel that that's a little bit of interaction because of these in-class quizzes? Yes. Certain level of interaction. Because otherwise I'm so scared because I pick muscles and everything. So you guys are scared, right? Yes? yes. <laughs> Can I use that too? <laughs> I will, I will. So it was all because of my big muscles. Sounds good, sounds good. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, the others are saying that the format is good. So uh, yeah, the problem is that th this needs so much settings. You know that we came late to this lecture room because the professor prior to us was not willing to leave. And it takes us uh, 15 minutes to set up things. And that's a, I think that's a pretty serious drawback. So, and sometimes, like in the first lecture, you know, it wasn't that successful because all this green screen business that we were not able to do it properly, and that all slowed us down a bit. And sometimes, like remember when Suras was delivering his lecture, technical difficulties too. So that may be the problem in uh, YouTube. What about Echo? Is it that free of technical problems? Echo 360, is that a always smooth and nice, no, never any problems, or how is it? And again, I'm going to take this off from the recording, so you can say whatever you want. Ah, oh, I see, I see. So that's how it works. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there was a, you know, one old participant said that we should uh, set up the streaming room for a campus. We definitely should. I completely agree with you. And can I, permission, can I, can I get your permission to use that statement in my presentation? Because we should, we should. You know, this, this stuff costs next to nothing, but it's quite a heavy to set up for each one of the lecture rooms. So that's not convenient. So instead we should have the screen screen and everything ready camera ready, we just come and start streaming. Okay, so I got the permission. Thank you. All right, so let's then go. And like I mentioned, we're gonna keep this lecture a little bit shorter than usually. And uh, we're gonna open a new topic today. And remember in the very beginning, in the first lecture, I saw this uh, kind of like semantic representation of machine to you. And I explained that the machine consists of several different disciplines. And one of the disciplines we've been busy is this one here. Uh, what? What? What happened to that? Okay, so it came back. How? Th this is very scary. What is doing this? Just a second. So it didn't like my pen, that's for sure. Why? Okay, now I'm back in my, whoa. So it really behaves weird way. Let me see. No, it doesn't matter what pen I'm using, it's all the time the same. Okay. I guess that I'm not gonna use my pen today. Don't really don't understand why it behaves like this. Okay, I could use it here, so that's no problem. But as soon as I put it in a presentation mode, just a second, it starts flashing like no limit. No, it's okay. So we're safe. Okay, here. All right, so we, you guys see this. Okay, so we started here. So we've been busy to explain things about 
mechanics. And we learn this technique that is a beautiful, beautiful technique called multi body system dynamics. Beautiful because you can apply that to any mechanical system you want. No limitation regarding the magnitude of a rotation, which usually is the case in many methods. And you can take the joints that are connected to body into account. So that's another great benefit. And it's very straightforward, the major benefit. No thinking needed, you're just following the certain steps and you can create the equation of motion automatically. But it's just mechanical components. So it means that using this technology, you can model this steel structure of the cranes, you can model the four bar mechanism, lift arm, swing arm, and the piler, but that's not a machine because machine needs to be actuated. And what we're gonna do starting today is that we're gonna move the focus from the mechanical modeling. We're gonna start looking at the modeling of actuators. Why? Because basically we need to know how the system is moving. So that's what we're basically interested in. Roughly speaking, situation is such that remember this, there's a Newton's second law which says externally applied force is equal than inertia forces. Let's write it like this. That's the equation of motion. And big mysteria, most of the cases when you're modeling the mechanical structure is this one. What about the force? What about the externally applied force? I've been telling that it's okay, it's a force component that is applied to system. The reason you get this force component, where are they coming from? Well, they're coming from actuators. So force is offered by actuators. Okay, how much force? Because that makes a big difference, right? Because if you need to guess this one, if this is unclear to you, how good is your solution? How good is your solution, which is this one here? Not very good. Not very good. You can get this correctly. This mass, you can get it correctly. But if you're guessing the force, value of your solution is next to nothing. It's not significant whatsoever. So it's a very big problem. So now what we need to do is that we need to take a look. How is this force and how big is a force and how the force is fluctuating as a function of time? And that will be next. And you know, there are different kind of actuators, like I explained in our first lecture. There are hydraulics is very often used, particularly in the mobile machinery, because the power density is so high. That means that, you know, small physical dimensions of actuators can produce large amount of forces. You need that, particularly in a mobile application where you are, you don't want to make too heavy components. You kind of limited what comes in a space. You're, you're not having all the space in your uses. So the hydraulics is very often used. But other actuators that you could use are, of course, electric drives, which are becoming to be more and more popular. There is a big trend that people would like to replace hydraulic actuators by electric drives. And there are many reasons to do that. You know, the, you know, the electric drives are more stiffer than hydraulic actuators. They can be more controllable because of that particular feature. They don't leak. You know, the, usually the problem in the hydraulics is that there's always a little bit of leakage and the leakage makes things looking bad. They look nasty and they look not so great. And that's a big problem because, you know, most of the time when you have, want to have a new machine, you want to look at shiny and pretty for many years. And in hydraulics, it's... Uh, becomes a bit difficult because of the leakage. Okay, it could be pneumatics, but the pneumatics is very soft. It's very flexible, and that makes it hard to be used in a mechatronic applications, in applications where there is a feedback, and you're controlling the force based on your feedback. It means that it's acting slowly, but it could be used. It could be used. And then some more exotic things like water hydraulics, uh, maybe, maybe some, some, some else, but uh, those are the most often used are hydraulics, electric drives, and pneumatics. 
this course, we're going to take a look at only the hydraulics, nothing else. So, and then we're going to look like how is that we can model the system that consists of hydraulics and mechanical components and how they behave as an assembled entity. That's a big challenge for us. Okay. So this is it. Now, a few more observations before we're moving on. Remember this slide. This came from uh, first lecture. So now you guys, I, I noticed that some, some of you were walking like this, uh, move walking all, already, so you were celebrating that I scored so high from my midterm exam. So I'm a strong big guy. Don't build up nose attitude, because look how much or how little the written exam affects to you. So even if you were score five out of five, I would like to emphasize that that's still half the story. There will be another midterm exam that will be available in uh, six weeks. So you need to score high that as well. And even if you do, do so, if you get five out of five from all these midterm exams, that's going to be this one. That's going to be your written, written exam. So it's not going to be that big percentage of everything else. And if you're going to get that much, you know, if you look at the grading scale, if you get 100% from the written exam, your grade will be one out of five, which is okay, but not so much. So what else you need to do? You still need to be busy with your weekly homework. So we're almost done with the weekly homework. There will be two or three more weeks, weekly homeworks, and then we're done. Then we're done. And then it's more about, like I said, this, this next, this period, the second period is all about pleasant topics. How is the weather? How are you doing in other courses? Stuff like that. And also a little bit about the actuators and things like that. But uh, if you look at the level of difficulty, the second period is significantly easier than the first one. Remember these big mountains. We are not going to go on the mountains anymore. So it's all done. So it's simple business, mathematically, very straightforward. So that's the good news. Okay, simulation work, that will be available, if not this week, next week. It means awful lot to your final grading, 35%. And in class quizzes, max 10%. Remember, this is the entire formula. Any comments? All clear. All clear. All right. So I promise you this. That we're going to, you know, we, I promise you that we're going to leave the mechanics. We never, yes, sir. How much time you have to complete the work? That will be until the, the midterm exam, second midterm exam. So there will be at least six weeks time to do it. And we usually give you extra time as well. And remember this, whatever difficulties you're experiencing, you let us know, me and Surat, in advance, and we can do miracles for you. And if you pass the deadline, there's nothing we can do for you, nothing. Keep this in your mind. And we wanna keep this way. Because it's going to be a big headache for us too. Because if you pass the deadline, let's say the submission of the simulation work, you're late, you don't contact us. But then once you're late, you contact us and say, hey, I need more time because I'm late. Then you are off. We are not going to give it to you. But you let us know that in advance, we can do so much for you. So we, are, we can be pleasant people. We can. It's not that we want, but we can. Okay, so uh, I was here. Oh my God, why, why is that I'm so slow today? Okay, now it's real responsibility to do this, meaning speed up, speed up. Okay, so I said that we're gonna look at the mechanic, or we're gonna leave the mechanics away. We're gonna focus on actuators. I wasn't entire, entirely correct when I say that because there will be one more story that I would like to tell you what is related to mechanics. And that is uh, another way to build the equation of motion. Now you know the method based on Lacran's multipliers, where you're adding the constraints, the original equation of motion. And I'm going to explain you another alternative, which is 
substitute the constraints inside of your equation of motion. Each method have the advantages and disadvantages, but you're going to learn this another method now. It's going to be mathematically painful. Now, all what I said that the second period is all pleasant, it's all about the weather and stuff like that, that wasn't correct. Because one more serious effort, and then we're going to discuss something a bit more pleasant. Okay. All right. Equation of motion, embedded technique. Embedded, meaning substituted in the constraint inside of your equation of motion. Embedded. Augmented formulation was the method where you added the constraints to your equation of motion with help of Lacan's multipliers. So this is conceptually very different approach. This is very different in the sense that it will lead you the number of differential equation, which will be the equation equal than the number of degrees of freedom. Now, if you have a system that consists of uh, 600 uh, uh, generalized coordinates and 599 constraint equation, you're still going to use just the one differential equation. That's a big difference comparing the method based on Lacan's multipliers. Okay, so here's the story. Remember, we look at this, and I'm going to be pretty brief here because this is still like a aftermath of final item about the multi-body system dynamics. And again, like I said, that the emphasis this week will be, not this week, but in this period will be about uh, will be about uh, accurate modeling. And I see that there are some some uh, bots that are sending messages to, to our chat. I don't know how to get rid of that. Just don't know. OK, so I have here equation, which I would like to minimize by accounting the constraint here. So I have two variables. And now uh, I need to find the minimum of this equation by taking the constraint, which is here, into account. And you learn that this can be made in a way that you're adding your constraint using the Lacan's multipliers, or something you learned already in uh, high school, that you substituted this constraint equation, the original equation, and then you minimize it. One variable at a time. So the substitution is embedded technique. That's what it is. That's in the mathematics. Next, we're going to do the same by using multi-body terminology. OK, so here's, here's, a, okay, so here's your equations. So I'm going to first take a look at the y1. So I'm going to solve the y1 for my constraint equation. So it's going to be 1 plus y2. And I'm going to substitute that information here. And that, uh, by the way, why this is not looking the same. This was my original equation. And when I'm solving this one here, oh, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. So at the first, uh, y2, this one here. So I'm going to put this other side of the equation. This comes back. And when I'm doing the substitution here, this is how it looks. This is the final form. And now I'm going to differentiate that with respect to my variables. I only have one variable. So it's a very simple differentiation that I need to do. So I'm differentiating that with respect to y1. This is my first equation. Not enough information, because I have two variables. I can solve this one using this information, but then I need to know the other one too. Another one, I'm replic replicating what I just did. So this time, I'm going to solve uh, this one here, y1. I'm going to put this in another side of the equation. Here it is. And I'm going to differentiate that with respect to y2. And that's going to be my second equation. Now, you've got this point of uh, where you minimize uh, the equation in a way that you are not violating the, in the, against the constraints. And now we're going to do the same in multi-body way. OK, I'm going to take you back to this equation. This equation, which was based on concept of virtual work. Remember, I got this concept in a way that I say that virtual work done by external applied forces is equal than the virtual work done by inertial forces. Virtual work was a force multiplied by virtual displacement. And I got this one here. And I say that 
this equation is not equal to zero because uh, this virtual displacement is not necessarily kinematically admissible. It needs to be expressed in a way that is kinematically possible. And the way that I'm doing it at the moment is that I'm introducing that to all possible direction. So I'm not obeying the constraints. I'm violating against the constraints. And that's why I cannot set this equation to be equal to zero. But how can I express this displacement in a way that is kinematically possible displacement? In certain simple mechanisms, you can figure that out by yourself. And then, uh, oh, by the way, I need, to, I need to mention you something because I just got the comment from Chad, like, is it possible to get the right answer from the midterm exam one? Yes, it's, you already have it. You notice it? So you, you notice where you made a mistake, all right? Mistakes, I don't think you make a mistake in Florida. Maybe one single one but not much, okay. But yeah, you have it. I don't know how you can see it. You cannot see it. You can. Okay, so the instructions are such that you go exam, and then you click review. Okay, let me try to repeat this again. So. You go to Moodle, you look at the something called review. No, midterm. midterm exam. You click the midterm exam, and then you click the review. Yeah. All right, you heard me. You. Ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. So there is a number you scored. Like, what was your grading? And then you click. Next to that, there is a button which says review. Yeah. You click the review, you see where you made a mistake. I recommended you to do that. Oh yeah, there are instructions and um, you know, others are sending instructions as well. But I was here to explain what is a kinematically admissible displacement. Kinematically admissible displacement is a displacement like this. You know, you take a hold of the piston body, you move that left and right. And others are following because of the constraints. But how you can express that in a general way? So it's all about this one here, this delta component, delta Q, how you can do it. And that's what I'm going to teach you next. It will be based on the method called coordinate partitioning. So we're going to participate, parti partitioning our coordinates to two different scenarios, the two different categories. Categories is a correct word. So the ones that are called independent coordinates and then rest that are called dependent coordinates. And generally speaking, you can do the selection as you want, but number of independent coordinates must be the same that the number of degrees of freedom. In this case, the number of degrees of freedom is one. So one coordinate can be selected to be independent. Rest will be dependent. And what that means, that you can introduce the virtual displacement or any displacement to this independent coordinates and the rest of the coordinates will follow because of the constraints. It's, like pretty much the case that I just explained it. You take a hold of the piston here, you move piston left and right, and other bodies will follow. How they will follow, that will come from the method based on the coordinate partition. Okay, so that's what it is. All right, so like I mentioned, you take all your generalized coordinates, that you categorize them two different ways. You can call some of the coordinates as a dependent coordinates and some of the coordinates as an independent coordinates. Generally speaking, you can do this selection as you want. But like I said, only thing that matters is that this one here, number of independent coordinates must be the same than the number of degrees of freedom. This one here, the number of dependent coordinates must be the same but the number of constraint equations. You know, in a mathematic or in a multi-body software that are based on this coordinate partitioning, they don't do that um, like uh, mechanically, or they don't ask operators and users to do this selection, but they're using method calls, Cousin, cousin uh, um, elimination with a full pivoting 
to do this selection. That's a mathematical method that do this selection to you automatically. We don't need to go that much in the detail of that method, but that, that is uh, for your information. It's mentioned here, Carlson elimination with full pivoting. Sometimes I think it is called column pivoting. You're changing the order of uh, your generalized coordinates based on this method. That's for your information. Okay, now, case like this. This example, the number of independent generalized coordinates will be one, three, five, nine. Okay, let me let me go back here. Remember, this must be equal to the number. Okay, this is my independent coordinates. Must be the same that the number of degrees of freedom. What is number of independent coordinates here? Okay, 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 okay. Don't say anything. Don't say any. Oh, hold on, hold on. Okay, is this too risky business now? Too risky business because of the dancing. It might be. Just a second. Uh, it's not on. Uh, huh. Hmm. Oh, I changed the password. What, what the heck is my uh, my password here? Uh, hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I have a big problem because I don't remember my password at the moment. Uh, hmm. There will be no way that I can remember that. Absolutely no way. Can I sign with the Google? So it, is it able to take me back to my, my account? Let, let me try this. Okay, so that, that, that's uh, me. No, that's a, that's not. I don't want to go this way. Oh, just a second. I, I think that I can find it. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. No, this is YouTube. Uh, okay, I'm not, I don't know, I don't remember my password today. Uh, yeah, not going to work out today. Is this save? No. OK, so I need to get back to this next week. But you know that the number of independent coordinates need to be the same that the number of degrees of freedom. So in this case, correct that. Oh, you don't see this. But uh, so let me take myself back to this one. No, not this one. You don't see this yet. No, still not. Uh, okay. Number of degrees of freedom you can compute by counting the number of generalized coordinates. So it's going to be how many moving bodies? One, two, three. So it's going to be three multiplied by three. Okay, how many constraints I have here? One, two, three revolut constraints. So it's two multiplied by three plus one 
translational joint, plus two. That's going to be eight. That's going to be nine. So it's one. This one is correct. All right. So here's the deal. I'm going to ask this next week. No, it's not going to be 100 percent. But it will be hopefully. Um, hopefully, it's going to be high. I'll let, let me hope. I hope that. But we'll see. We'll see how high it's going to be. Okay. Now comes uh, this involving mathematics. But cause of this, this. So you just. Uh, okay. The so concept is this: you categorize your coordinates, and then you just follow into certain procedure. What is this procedure? That's the one that is shown here. So you are using this coordinate partitioning in your Jacobian matrix, meaning that if your Jacobian matrix is something like this, let's say that you have a symbol bendel on body, you will have three columns, two rows because of the two constraint equations because of the three generalized coordinates. Now you're going to use this Jacobian matrix you can divide that to according to your selection of dependent and independent coordinates. So two rows, just give me two, two, well, two rows and two columns will be the one that is called dependent. That's going to be a skewer matrix. So maybe you can want to select the first two ones to be your dependent coordinates. You will get two by two matrix instead of uh, original Jacobian matrix. And then you will have one vector of two components, what is left. Okay, using this categorization in your Jacobian matrix, you can express this one here. And now using this, and now this is set to be equal to zero. And now it is possible to solve this dependent part or the dependent generalized coordinates. And it will be based on independent generalized coordinates. Remember what I just said to you. I said that once you know the independent coordinates, you can solve the rest of the coordinates by using constraints. That's exactly what I'm doing here. So I'm using Jacobian matrix to solving all the coordinates. Once I know the one coordinate, which is in the independent, independent one. Now using this notation, and look at that. So you need to invert this dependent part. And now it becomes handy to use this uh, Gaussian elimination because in Gaussian elimination, it will select these dependent coordinates clever way, making sure that this dependent part is invertible. If you do it by yourself, you may end up to be in a situation that you cannot invert it, and that's when your simulation will stop. Okay, anyway, so for moving on, following on. Now, this is your all the generalized coordinates and then the two different categories are this, dependent and independent. And using the information from the previous slide, I can express this situation such that I'm using my independent coordinates and I can get all the generalized coordinates, dependent and independent. And that's the, that's the thing. That's what I need. That's the way to express my virtual displacement in a way that is kinematically admissible, kinematically possible. So I can continue. Because I wasn't sure if you guys are interested in this anymore. Maybe I promised too much when I said, okay, it's going to be interesting and everything. And then you guys are expecting some, I don't know what you're expecting. But can you be with me another 15 minutes? Then we're done. That's a promise, which I will keep. Not just saying, but I will keep that promise. Time is on, 15 minutes. Okay? All right. So here it is. Now, using this relation, I can express my virtual displacement such the way that is not violent against the constraint. So I'm substituting my constraints inside of the equation of motion. That's what I'm doing here, substitution. And now I can set this equation to be equal to zero because now this one here, make sure that it's not violating against the constraint because it is a displacement that is possible. Rest will follow because of the constraint. This is it. Now, there is a one more problem here. 
and that's this guy here. This acceleration still includes all the coordinates. So I need to use a coordinate positioning in acceleration level. And once I do that, then I'm completely done. Okay, here's the summary. In augmented formulation, it's kind of like you deassemble your structure. You look at the reaction forces, which are based on Lacrosse multipliers. Your Jacobian matrix is telling where they're applying. Whereas in embedded technique, you're just selecting one coordinate out of the many, and you solve this one coordinate, then the rest you will solve based on Jacobian matrix or coordinate partitioning in Jacobian matrix. That's all. That's the concept difference, conceptual difference. Here, you know, if we compute, we compute that this, this system needs nine generalized coordinates and eight constraint equations. Using the method based on Lacrosse multipliers, number of unknowns will be 17. Whereas when you're using coordinate partitioning, the number of unknowns will be how much? How many, how many differential equations I need if I'm gonna use this subdivision technique? You don't know that yet, but you can guess it. Just shoot it. What do you think? How many do you think I need? Three. Good guess. So three was a guess. Others. My coffee friend. What do you say? How much? What was that? Three. So you two are voting three. Okay, let me let me do this. Okay, so let's vote it. So one, three, nine. 100. Who is saying one? You must cast your vote. Okay, so th this is my guy. So it's a one vote. You sure about that? You sure you don't want to change your vote? Because you're the only one. You're the only one. Let me emphasize, you're the only one. Only one. Okay, three. Three. Most of the students are voting three. Nine. No one. 100. And who is correct is my friend here. So one. Why? Because one degrees of freedom. This is a one degrees of freedom system. You need one independent coordinate and you can express your differential equation based on that independent generalized coordinate. Rest will be solved automatically. So this is conceptually very different. Different than this method based on Lacrosse multipliers. Here comes a kind of the summary, how it is. Oh! And I lost this, you know, all online participants. I don't want to feel you guys that you feel bad, but I would like you to know that all, every single one in online participants are saying one. What do you say about that? <laughs> okay, all right. So, uh, okay. So this is the story in total. So this is the way you can uh, set this virtual work to be equal to zero. So we could just test it this shortly. You know, first you're mapping this force to generalize coordinates, and then you express it in a way that it is kinematically admissible displacement. And then you can set this equation to be equal to zero. Okay, then there is an example which I'm gonna briefly show it to you. This is gonna be very, very brief. This mechanism we have looked many times. So there's a primitive joint, another primitive joint, and take up our matrix look like this. So I'm going to categorize this Jacobian matrix based on this selection. So I'm selecting my R1 and R2 to be my dependent coordinates. The coordinate that I'm using to solve this system will be the angle theta, my independent coordinate. If you're not happy with this selection, you can do any kind of selection you want. Just number is what matters here, nothing else. Okay. All right, so I'm going to do this selection. So this is going to be my dependent part and rest will be independent. Uh, look at this. This was really convenient selection because now I need to invert my dependent part and that turned out to be identity matrix. Inverting our identity matrix is very simple. Identity matrix is a solution. And that's what you're going to get. And then you, once you multiply that, then you can find the relation between all the generalized coordinates and independent generalized coordinates. 
I'm following this procedure and I'm going to take a look at this force and I'm express this force by using generalized coordinates. So this force is applying in origin of the body reference coordinate system. So this is where the force is applying. This is my force in global coordinates. This is my vector of generalized extended applied forces. Everything you know already. So no surprises here. And now finally, I'm going to find an equilibrium by using this stuff to do so. So I'm going to get started from the concept of virtual work. I'm going to map, out, map that uh, force to be expressed in generalized coordinates. And then I'm going to do that by in a, in a way that it's going to be kinematically admissible displacement. So it's going to look like this. Here's my force vector. Here's my this part that is needed here. Once I do the multiplication, I can find it out that my equilibrium is this position or this position. Static equilibrium. So I was just looking at the statics here, nothing else. Not dynamic yet. But the same way I can extend this to dynamics like I did in uh, statics. Seven minutes left. Was that correct? You didn't, put the, you didn't put the timing on. Okay, so here's an embedded technique, in short. So this is where we started. This is kinematic admissible displacement. This is how everything looks. Final thing that I need to do is that I need to get rid of this, all the generalized coordinates in acceleration level. And I can get rid of them by using, again, coordinate partitioning. But this time in acceleration level, I'm going to be very brief here because this is very mechanical. So I'm going to first take this uh, QC that I'm already uh, familiar with, and then I'm going to use coordinate partitioning in this level. I can find the relation between dependent acceleration and rest of the acceleration. And that's what I need to express this by using independent coordinates. Sorry that I'm really, really brief here. So this is the relation that I'm after. And using this uh, notation that I introduced previous slide, and calling them as a B and D, my final equation of motion look like this. This is going to be the minimum number of differential equations. That's going to be the same as the number of degrees of freedom. OK. So what do you guys say? Should we have a five minutes break? Because I would like to put my in-class quiz on. There will be another in-class quiz available momentarily. So I'm going to um, spend some time to figure that out. And uh, five minutes is enough for me. What about you? OK, five minutes and then we're back. Then one example about the embedded technique. And then hydraulics. Then hydraulics. Okay. Good.
Yeah, I, I realize that I'm muted, so I'm back. Okay. And a final attempt. Oh, you don't see this. Um, Okay, here it goes. Ah. Okay, so final thing here. So I have here a symbol mechanism, something we look already uh, two weeks back. So this is a this mechanism that consists of one moving body. There is a primitive. Just a second, I need to check. Like, like if. Uh, just a second, I'm not sure if I'm still muted or not. Yeah, I'm no longer muted, so it's okay. Complain something about my voice. Don't know what it is. Okay, anyways. Taking myself back here. And here it goes. All right, very good. So this is a mechanism you are familiar with. So one moving body, primitive joint D here. So this, this part can only slide along the global y-axis. This can slide along the global x-axis. This is it. So one body, two constraint equations. So something you are used to deal with. And now what I'm gonna do today is that I'm gonna express the equation of motion using this embedded technique, meaning that I'm going to substitute my constraints inside of the equation of motion. All right? Make sense. Prior to that, in this example, the number of unknowns will be what? Number of unknowns, the number of variables that I need to solve, how much that's going to be. Is it going to be one, three, five, or six? Any class quiz is on. It is on. My, I found my password. You found it, you are, are you able to lock in? All right, then the game is on. Success rate. What's gonna be the success rate today? 90. 90 what? 96? 96. What are the others are you saying? What are you saying? It's going to be, okay, so there's 84. 84 in uh, online, one online participants is voting 84. Others, what do you say? 100. Not 100 today. 90. 90, that's, that's quite high. Okay, can, can I move on and get back to this momentarily? Okay, so here's what I do. Again, I have certain number of steps. So I'm gonna follow these steps and automatically I'm gonna get my equation of motion. So no thinking whatsoever. And the first step is something that you're very much familiar with, construction of mass matrix. No difference in terms of embedded technique or automatic formulations, it's all the time same. All right, so um, I, well, here you see that I'm using this sophisticated mathematics, but I don't need to do so. It's gonna be three by three matrix, diagonal rep representation because body reference coordinate system was located in the center of the mass, like this. Here's my mass of the body. Here's my mass moment of inertia with respect to this point, which is middle of the beam-like body. No surprises. First step, done. Second step, generalized external applied forces. Again, no difference comparing the previous formulation and this formulation. So here's my forces expressed using global coordinates. And then I'm gonna take a look where the force is applying. So it's this point here. And when I'm expressing this point, 
it's going to be just this r vector nothing else because the vector u bar will be equal to zero when i do this differentiation it's going to give me this mapping matrix this mapping matrix multiplied by force vector will give me this vector of extended applied generalized forces step number two done not complicated at all step number three quadratic velocity vector equal to zero because body reference coordinate system is located at the center of the mass that's it very simple then comes the first difficult part the construction of matrix b now i need to do the selection of dependent and independent coordinates but here is kind of obvious because uh, these vector r component i really should select those to be dependent because it helps my mathematics significantly and then i'm going to select the angle theta to be my independent coordinate now here's my jacobian matrix and again the similar way that in a static equilibrium i'm going to do this selection i'm going to take this sub matrix which is two by two and i'm going to call that as a, as a dependent part of the jacobian matrix rest what is left going to be independent part of the jacobian matrix and with this selection with this procedure i'm able to express all the generalized coordinates once i know the independent one that's what i'm doing so that's the substitution that i'm doing here and you know this is a dependent part independent part and when i use this cdi so inverting this part multiplied by this matrix this is how the matrix b look like okay one more step which is matrix d which is this painful related to velocity so here's my velocity expression so these are the, all these painful components this is dependent part of the jacobian matrix again you know i started here this is um, let me see this is uh now i got confused yeah this is a typing mistake here because this so obviously should be once that's my jacobian matrix supposed to be my jacobian matrix so this instead of zero should be once when i multiply this by this i'm gonna get this one yeah that's right now it makes sense this by this i'm gonna get this one yeah it makes sense that is then differentiated with respect to generalized coordinates now it makes sense now this is correct that is multiplied by velocity of generalized coordinates that's going to be that part of that equation needed i'm going to continue here these and these components will be equal to zero and then my cd which is needed here i get why once i inverted my dependent part of the jacobian matrix that's finally my d symbolic math tools will do it for you okay here is my final equation of motion so here's my b mass matrix b then um, acceleration so this is my unknown my only unknown and once you do this uh, matrix multiplication you're going to get the single differential equation because your unknowns is just a scalar component one single variable nothing else Okay, which is your preference? Which method you like the most? One based on Lacan's multipliers, one based on coordinate partitioning. Before you answering that, let me explain you something. You know, when I was young, and I'm still young, so, uh, you know, you know, the multi-body system dynamics community was uh, heavily divided by European participants and American participants. They are American, they were American teams and uh, European teams. And for some reason, the European teams, they always liked this embedded technique because it was so elegant and clever. So you got rid of all these messy Lacrance multipliers. American teams, they prefer uh, Lacrance multipliers because it was just a like simple method. No thinking, it's very clear, no thinking whatsoever. And my background is of course from United States. I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but uh, that's uh, where my knowledge came from. So guess which is my favorite? Lacrosse multipliers, of course. But now you can say whatever you like. 
but make sure that it's Lacron's multipliers. Okay, so you can select whatever you want. They're gonna all lead to same responses. Now here comes something important too, because sometimes you hear these weird stories that the response is based on your formulation. It's like the dynamics is changing depending what formulation you use. Of course, it will not change. Of course, always you're gonna get the same responses regardless of the selection of your method. Keep this in your mind, because sometimes you hear this weird stories that you could get better results by using this and that. No, the response is all the time same. You can get maybe, you can possibly gain some computational efficiency, but the final solution will be same all the time, if you make things correctly. Because physics is all the time same. All right, so with that, so here comes a summary. No, embedded technique, so it's based on coordinate partitioning. Equations of motion are not involving the reaction forces because we substituted them. So they disappeared. So we don't have it. Only very few number of equations of, of equa differential equations are needed. Then uh, augmented, augmented formulation, so it's a very large number of unknowns number of differential equations needed is very high, but it's very simple, and reaction forces are included to your solution. Which one is more efficient? This is a really, really hard to tell because, you know, uh, there is no such thing like the most efficient formulation. It always depends on your application. Sometimes it's, uh, it's mentioned that this augmented, excuse me, this embedded technique is more efficient than augmented formulation, but it's not necessarily the case because the coordinate partitioning, if you do it properly, you should do it that every time step to make sure that your dependent coordinates are always made such that you can invert the dependent part of the Jacobian matrix. So it means that you need to do this computation every single time. That slows computation quite a bit. And, you know, computing all the coordinates, another messy business that can slow you down. So, hard to tell, but that's how they are. Tips for mechanical modeling. This is very important. So verify your model as frequently as you can. And as soon as you see something that doesn't make sense, that's where I recommend you to stop figure out why it's not making sense. Is your model incorrectly made or is there something that physics behaves in a way that you don't understand that so well? Make sure that you know the number of degrees of freedom all the time. Make sure that you're not making redundant constraints. Make sure you understand the physical meaning of, pro of all the parameters you use. This is going to be extremely important when we're going to discuss about the hydraulics because hydraulics is a full of parameters. What they're standing for, you must understand that. Okay, minor thing, never merge rigid bodies by fixed joint because it's not a good modeling policy. Analyze, visualize, visualize your, your model frequently during the modeling phase. Before the dynamic, try to find the static equilibrium. Sometimes it's really, really useful. Think, 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 and rather than do, do, do. Okay, with that, it will be hydraulics. But I was thinking that I'm gonna close today. So the only thing that we're gonna do today is that we're gonna take a look at the in-class quiz and I will get back to you in hydraulics next week, Monday. This period, we are not that much in a hurry. So we kind of can have some more interaction than usually. I know you guys hate it big time, but uh, that would be nice to me. We can even discuss about, I don't know, I was thinking carrier counseling, but I want to say the, save the carrier counseling, the course that I'm delivering in next semester. But if there's something else about uh, mm, how you can find, well, it's kind of related to carrier counseling. How is that you can find your thesis topic? We can discuss about that too. I have some slides about, you know, uh, what makes sense to do and what makes not sense to do and that kind of stuff. Do you think that, that could be useful to you? Okay. 
And also you need to think about the summer positions. I know that we are not yet in uh, Christmas time, but right after Christmas, there will be open positions available in, um, in our faculty and how you can apply and how it makes sense to apply. I can give you some hints to that. Very serious phases. Okay, so then this, don't go yet. What's going to be the success rate? Let me move this here. Oh, you don't see this yet. Uh, what should I do? This one, I guess. Uh, Okay, correct answer is what? One, because I want the degrees of freedom. And success rate is, come on. You wouldn't do that for sure, I know that for a fact. So one degrees of freedom, so it's a one unknown that is needed here. Okay, anyway, so we continue with the hydraulics on uh, next week, Monday. So, See you guys then. Take it easy. Have fun and uh, see you later.